Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the New Zealand Initiative. My name is Robert Hartwig, I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event. It's the last event for us for this year, because we, are, we didn't want to compete with all the Christmas and end-of-year celebrations happening in Wellington, but it's a great event, and it's a great event to finish the year on, because we have um, a very distinguished speaker with us tonight, Sir Robert Dean. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to us. And we've got an important topic to discuss, lost in the regulatory maze. Now, as you know, the New Zealand Initiative is all about making New Zealand a free and prosperous country. And to that end, it is vitally important to have good regulations in place. I'd like to give you a bit of a background to tonight's event and explain how this came about. We had our annual members retreat in March this year. And every year we host the Prime Minister for this retreat. And every year, one of our members complains to the Prime Minister that we've got a problem with red tape, with regulatory reform. Prime Minister, what can you do about it? I think the person who asked the question is even with us tonight, Peter. <laughs> Can't believe that. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Prime Minister basically um, played the ball back into our field and said, well, if you're so concerned about regulations, why don't you help me identify scrappable regulations, regulations that we could reform? Why don't you tell me which pieces of regulation, of legislation, you would like to reform? And so, a couple of days later, I sent an email to all our members asking them for recommendations. You heard the Prime Minister, can you please help? And I got a very long email from Roderick <laughs> telling me everything that was wrong with regulation in New Zealand. Um, it didn't find its way into this publication, but instead I invited uh, Sir Roderick to speak to us at an event once we launched this report to give us the broader picture, the ideas of what, what is really wrong with the state of regulation in this country. And this is how this event came about. Now, hosting events with uh, Sir Roderick Dean have um, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantage first, if I only read through Roderick's CV, um, there wouldn't be any time left for his speech. The advantage, of course, is that he doesn't need an introduction. Because, as you may all know, Roderick is um, one of New Zealand's most distinguished economists, public officials, and also with a long career in the private sector. So really one of uh, the most qualified people in this country to speak about regulations, regulatory reforms, and what's wrong with the regulatory set of New Zealand. So it's really my great honor, my privilege, my pleasure to welcome Sir Roderick to the event tonight. And I'll just hand over to you and let you explain why we are lost in the regulatory maze and hopefully how we can get out of it. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. And um, I see that the two papers are here um, to remind me uh, of the work that the New Zealand Initiative has done in this area. You know, my experience with regulation goes back a long way because I had uh, strict Methodist parents, um, as Gillian was reminding me, as we were driving in this evening. Uh, and so my life was filled with rules and regulation. Um, and it gave me great cause to reflect on how unreasonable and unfair uh, regulation can at times be. <laughs> um, and despite that, uh, I ended up, of course, as a regulator, uh, because I worked at a senior level in the Reserve Bank, and then I was the Chairman of the State Services Commission. Um, and during that period, uh, I learned about the problems of administering regulation. And then I ended up in the private sector. I was chairman of several companies in New Zealand uh, and uh, learned the other side of regulation and the problems of living uh, with excessive regulation. And also the dilemmas of getting a good understanding about regulation between those who administer the regulations and those who have to live with them. Uh, and sometimes never the train shall meet. Anyway, um, I am reminded of Ronald Reagan's, um, I'm old enough to remember him, uh, uh, his, his view of government's role in the economy, if it moves, tax it, if it keeps moving, regulate it, and if it stops moving, subsidise it. We've done our fair share of each of those uh, in New Zealand, I guess. Um, there's been no shortage of activity in New Zealand on regulation. 
Um, and of course, uh, in a positive way, there's been the creating the toolbox for regional prosperity, the work of the New Zealand Initiative, and reducing unnecessary regulatory costs, the report that Oliver referred to, um, where he didn't publish my submission. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, there's been the 500-page report by the New Zealand Productivity Commission, which I'm sure you will all have read, uh, and I have read all 500 pages of it. And there are other groups as well that, who are working on um, how do we do a better job around regulation. So don't think of my talk as being, um, you know, critical of the so much of the fact that work is progressing. Um, I really want to step beyond that. Uh, to the more fundamental economics um, around regulation, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, in terms of the um, in terms of the regulatory impact statements that government agencies have to prepare, this is the internal quality assessments that were made by the Treasury, where you'll see that. Um, they, they thought that 60% in the last year of people met the um, quality assessment, but then they got an external assessment done, and they concluded that 70% um, did not meet, uh, or only partially met, um, the requirements. So here's a huge gap between what the internal people think about how successful their regulations are being uh, put together in terms of these impact set statements um, and an external assessment of it. And so there's a need clearly to get some re re reconciliation of that and to some extent that's of course what the um, Productivity Commission uh, has endeavoured to do with its really huge and uh, hugely commendable report. The Productivity Commission and Mary Sherwin here tonight and Ms Grant and there might be other members um, of the team, I think have done a fantastic job in trying to sort out, you know, what are the disturbing situations around regulation and then trying to answer, well, what do we do about some of them? Here are some of the facts about how 90% of firms say that regulations are contradictory or incompatible. Three quarters of them say that they'll impose additional costs. Uh, you might say, well, that's what they would say anyway if you're a regulator. Um, I promise you, from the point of view of the commercial world, regulations impose all manner of costs. And so there's a series of facts that have emerged here that really raise the question of what do we do about trying to do a better job on regulation. There's a chart there with the same um, summary. And the Productivity Commission concluded that we uh, can do much better. Uh, we have about something like between 10 and 14,000 people employed on regulation in New Zealand. That's quite a good-sized team. Um, <laughs> uh, we, have, we have about 350 legislative instruments and up to 150 acts per year um, coming to pass, many of them affecting the commercial world. Um, there's almost 3,000 acts actually in force. So, you know, we've got an army of regulators administering a huge volume of regulation. But then the Productivity Commission concluded there's surprisingly little information about regulation and the effects of regulation and the performance of our regulatory systems. Um, and they, of course, pointed out the fact that poor regulation impedes productivity and growth, adds significant costs, um, and, and disconcertingly said there's surprising complacency at times around um, the situation of regulation. Uh, well, you can see that uh, we managed to reduce the public service here hugely. The peak uh, was in 1986, um, when I became chairman of the State Services Commission. And then you'll see that the numbers went down to about 35,000, around 2,000, under my successor, Don Hun. Um, and, you know, with the help of all his colleagues, including the Treasury um, and the various agencies. But this is a huge reduction in the number of public servants that we achieved at that time. This is the core public service. Some of that came out of the SOEs being created, of course. Um, but there were real savings um, in many areas. And then we had a period through the 2000s um, where those numbers grew strongly, uh, and part of that growth, of course, was stimulated by um, a range of re-regulation which occurred through that period. Um, and then we've sort of flattened out, uh, but uh, one suspects that there's plenty of scope there from further efficiencies. <coughs> 
And um, not only do we have this issue of uh, growth of public service numbers, which has been on our plate for the last decade, um, but we pay people in the public sector more than we pay people in the private sector on average. Mm -hmm. And if you then do jobs like for like, um, as one or two people have done detailed analysis of that issue, um, then the same applies <coughs> regardless just of the average wage if you actually do like for like jobs using job size measurements and so on. You come to the same conclusions so here we are, we're paying our public servants a lot more on average than we pay private sector people. Their pay increases are going up faster. There's large numbers of them uh, and, uh, and there's a stack of them who look after our regulatory um, systems. So what makes for successful regulation? Uh, the Productivity Commission have set out um, all of these uh, <laughs> all these elements, but I mean, <laughs> so that sophisticated understanding, strong leadership, good cultures, professional workforce, good communications. Um, I mean, these are all logical and sensible, and you say to yourself, how the hell can these actually be delivered um, in all these different agencies? You know, what are the practicalities around this? Um, and, and so, at, uh, on their own explicit um, admission, the uh, Productivity Commission had, um, did not cover some aspects of the regulatory system, including the ones that really mattered a lot, such as the role of the individual regulators, the regime objectives, the policy making <coughs> process. That's what I'd really like to talk about tonight, is not how do we make the process better, you know, but why do we have regulations that have such widespread unintended consequences, and why do we do nothing much about that issue? So I think the Productivity Commission have done a fantastic job in saying, how can we do, it, do regulations better, and how can we do it more effectively, more efficiently? Uh, it is a bit of a preaching, um, you know, of all things good for all wise men but and women but uh, at the end of the day there's a huge missing element and that's really the underlying economics I don't think there's any unwillingness on the part of the Productivity Commission to address those issues it just happens that they didn't address them in this 500 pages um, and uh, there are of course now one or two areas that they are being asked to look into where they will be doing these things in, in much more depth so this graph is quite interesting because this has got the, um, if you look at the period from 19, from the mid 1980s through to the early 2000s on the graph. We're not getting any updates. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, there's the core public service numbers. Sorry, you should remind me. You know, my humble apologies. I'm trying to do two things at once electronically. It's beyond a normal mail. <laughs> uh, so there's the, there's the um, earnings um, of the public sector versus the private sector. Those are the staff numbers, you see the huge drop there, and then the increase again, um, and then flattened out um, over recent years. Um, and then here, what, does make, what makes successful regulation, um, and what was really excluded from that. And what was excluded, of course, um, was this, these areas that I just mentioned. Um, and so moving on, here's the graph of the multi-factor productivity growth. Um, and if you look at the period, if you look at that yellow part of the chart, um, that runs from the sort of mid-1980s through to the early 2000s. That's when we had in New Zealand the fastest rate of product, multi-factor productivity growth that we have achieved for many decades. Um, and much of that was driven by the private sector rather than the public sector, if you look closely at the numbers. I'm not as expert at that as somebody like Grant Scobie here, but nonetheless, looking at the generalisation of it, um, you'd have to say to yourself, that was a period of remarkable productivity growth. That happened to be also strong productivity growth in a number of other countries. It was a period also of um, comparative deregulation uh, for New Zealand. And if you worked in the private sector, um, as I did uh, through much of that period, uh, you one came to realise, of course, that deregulation allowed you to get things done faster and at lower cost, and we could really get things moving. And then you'll see that as we re-regulated um, post in the post-reform period, um, we ended up with um, 
and in the reform retreat period um, on that chart, the red line, we ended up with slowing of growth productivity in New Zealand. So where does the regulatory burden really lie? Um, you're familiar with all of these areas, or many of you would be familiar with all of these areas. There's a whole raft of territories um, that we regulate in New Zealand. And I've listed really those ones that most affect the commercial world. Um, I'd like now to move to an illustration of the principal theme of what I'd like to talk about, which is around the role of the regulators and what they do and the dilemmas that we actually end up with. So looking first at um, the Commerce Commission, and I don't know if there's anybody here from the Commerce Commission, and I don't want to be unfair to the Commission in terms of their findings, but at the end of the day, if you look at the Progressive Enterprises case, um, for example, and I do have the right one up there, yes. If you look at the Progressive Enterprises case um, versus Countdown uh, and, um, and Shane Jones and the suppliers, Essentially what happened in this case, Shane Jones, an MP, um, was very critical of Progressive Enterprises and were very critical of the um, relationships between Countdown and its suppliers. And so that was very damaging uh, for the sales of Countdown. All sorts of accusations were made, the media added to it. The um, Commerce Commission immediately said we'll do an investigation, which took months to do, not surprisingly. What was interesting about that, of course, was that they found that, that um, Countdown had not um, behaved inadequately on any front, uh, and they gave a complete clearance to Countdown. The disconcerting thing about that is that, in the meantime, you know, you have a reputation severely damaged, you have sales that have been adversely affected, earnings that are adversely affected, huge advantage to the competitor, who um, you know uh, stimulated the uh, parts of the activity, um, and uh, Shane Jones's letter, if you read it, um, the one to the Commerce Commission, you know, was short and inadequate and had no evidence in it whatsoever. And the Commerce Commission essentially went out and you know sought evidence, um, and the evidence didn't stack up in terms of um, there being a problem. So what do you do? You know, I mean, I was a, I was a director of Woolworths for a long time, but during this period, I had actually left the Woolworths board. Woolworths in Australia owned Progressive Enterprises, ran the countdown stores, um, and they talked to me quite a bit during the course of that. And you know, it's just a huge dilemma. Um, this sort of regulation that allows competitors to or suppliers to really give a company a hard time. Fletcher Building owns Winston Warboards, and Knopf. Um, came here to get into the wallboard game, gym, huge German company, much bigger than Fletcher's, um, and found life difficult, exited the market, complained to the Commerce Commission. The Commerce Commission announces major investigation, um, gives the, the media gives Fletcher Building and Winston a hard time, and again, um, months later, complete clearance for Fletcher's um, and for Winston's. Um, they, the idea that they'd be engaged in predatory pricing or um, unsatisfactory relationships, you know, in terms of the way they froze up the supply lines and so on, was found not to have substance. Uh, but in the meantime, um, the company has suffered uh, severe reputational loss. When Fletcher Building was approached by Stevenson Concrete, when I was chairman of Fletcher's, I was chairman of Fletcher Building for a long time, we were approached by Stevenson Concrete to purchase them. Um, and so, wisely or unwisely, we said to the Commerce Commission, is this okay? They said no. Um, and it took five years for them to change their mind, and they changed their mind after Stevenson's, of course, had lost a huge amount of money and said to the Commerce Commission, we're going to lay off all the staff, um, and they'll, you know, many of them will be unemployed. The Commerce Commission suddenly decided, you know, that it was okay for Fletcher's to buy what was really a very small operation. Um, and five years? <coughs> to make a decision, you know, or to change their minds. I mean, this is, this is nuts. This is not the way that regulatory systems are supposed to work. Um, so another illustration, we've got this Financial Markets Conduct Act, uh, which the government's very proud of. Um, and I presume you, any of you associated with companies have read, it's only 597 clauses. Um, uh, and 
And it's, these words are all in the preamble to the Act. <coughs> Avoid unnecessary compliance costs, reduce governance risks, promote innovation and flexibility. I'm not quite sure how legislation can promote innovation, but none of this. Um, provide understandable information, facilitate transparent markets, promote informed participation. Um, and despite this, the FMA now actually oversees or monitors 32 items of legislation, but be that as it may, um, all the simplification of our commercial legislation um, and financial le markets legislation need 597 clauses. And it's hugely complex, it's lengthy, it's detailed, it doesn't, in my view, meet any of the objectives that are laid out in the beginning of the Act. I mean, how can people who design these sorts of things write that sort of preamble and then write all these clauses? Because the 597 clauses, most of them have got numerous sub-clauses as well, of course. Um, and, you know, when I've asked directors if they've read it, I haven't encountered, I've encountered hardly any directors who've actually read it. And the courts are totally unsympathetic, of course, to you if you haven't read it and you're in strife. So what do are, what are directors do about these sorts of things? Well, prospectuses, I mean, there's actually provisions now for simplified <coughs> prospectuses. But what did we really do? Well, Fletcher's, when I was chairman, we probably made more acquisitions in New Zealand than any other major company, um, right through the 2000s up to now. Um, and so what did we do? We um, would not use prospectuses. We did overnight placements. Um, and so prospectuses were designed, of course, to protect small shareholders. But they're so long and detailed and hard to read and hard to absorb the risks, because you write into it every risk you can think of, of course, because you know that if you get before the court, they'll say, they'll say to you, why didn't you write the risk in, even though you know, the commercial world's full of risk. <coughs> um, so companies say to themselves, what do we do about this? Well, you know, you say you'd like to do a deal for small shareholders, to help them, and sometimes what we did at Fletcher's was we had a subsidiary offering to small shareholders that followed the major offering to the institutions overnight. An overnight placement, for those who don't know, means that you just ring up everybody during the night um, and you've got the money in the morning. And they're all regarded as sophisticated investors um, and, they, and they don't need a prospectus. What? So prospectuses are regulated so heavily that they then don't actually get used much. How many people were here would actually realise that was the case? IPOs, initial public offerings, we had numerous companies come to us um, asking whether we'd be interested in buying them. Every one of them that came to us, these were small family companies typically, every one of them that came to us had already considered whether they would actually list their company on the market and then they got their accountants and their lawyers to describe the risks to them and the cost to them and the delays, because, you know, <coughs> prospectuses take months to put together. Um, and, and they all decided that they'd be better off doing a trade sale. So all this legislation, what it's done is promote all this off-market activity mm -hmm. rather than on-market activity. It's quite contrary to what it was intended to do. It's just to spawn us. Why doesn't anybody understand that? Why, you know, when I talk to ministers about these sorts of issues, it's just a blank wall and they just think I'm self-interest capitalist or whatever. So on market takeovers, um, I mean, it's the same with... It's the same dilemma. Um, there's all these un unintended consequences. Um, Talking about takeovers, um, if you want to make a takeover, there's a whole stack of rules that you have to go through. I've got the takeover. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a whole stack of rules that you have to go through with takeovers. And um, the, the dilemma with takeovers uh, is that they're so time consuming, uh, and if you have to go through all the rules, you actually end up not knowing what shareholding you're going to end up with. So if you look at the statistics over the last 20 years in New Zealand, most years there's been very few takeovers. And they, they used to be headlines in newspapers um, years ago because they were, of course, 
a fantastic way of sorting out corporate dilemmas. So a company would get into strife and somebody else would take it over, and most, many of them occurred on market. Now what all the legislation around this, because, risk, because it's become such a high risk activity, people have looked for ways to go off market um, and ways to avoid takeovers in a public sense. So they make acquisitions, they use overnight placements, um, but they don't actually go into the market and buy the shares in the market and do a takeover as it's described in the Financial Markets Act. Now I could go through every element of the Act, just about, and say to you there are so many unintended consequences that we're actually almost getting the reverse effect. I mean the government's intention with the Act, consolidating it all, was what I set out earlier, you know, is to simplify it. Um, and in fact what we've ended up with is we've made it more complicated and people just really avoid these sorts of legislation. And there's legal ways and proper ways that you can do that. There's nothing improper about doing that. Um, the costs of some of these, uh, the cost of a takeover now is just horrendous in terms of the delays because you don't know where you're going to end up. Remuneration disclosure. My view of remuneration disclosure, I mean, it was, I, I can see why people wanted remuneration disclosure. But what it's ended up with is really just a lot of competition around higher salaries. It's, an, it's, an, it's facilitated the supply of information across the board to all manner of companies, including, ironically, the, pri the public sector, such that um, executive remuneration has actually gone up at a faster rate, I'm sure, than it would have had, it, had, there, had there not been disclosure. I don't know what we've really gained from disclosure, um, given that it's commercial, you know, it should be commercially sensitive information. You know, why? Should we be disclosing every, every element of our cost to, um, you know, our competitors? And then in the in the market for executives, of course, everybody's your competitor. So there we go. Um, there's another case here that's quite interesting to those people who have been associated with the Reserve Bank. Um, for many years, under the uh, Prudential regulations and the Prudential bail agreements and so on, um, the capital requirement for housing for banks for housing lending was 50% of that for all other forms of lending. So what led to the GFC? You know, of course, housing lending gets out of hand. People then start bundling up housing loans, sell them off. That was the sort of the nature of the dilemma around the GFC. A lot of that dilemma we managed to avoid in New Zealand. But at the end of the day, um, we did decide that house lending has been, um, you know, one of the factors driving house prices. We've been too generous on house lending, the risks have gone up. So what do we do? Um, you know, we go for another form of regulation um, with these loan to value ratio controls and so on. And they're not going to work either, I promise you. They'll lead to disintermediation, they'll lead to, um, you know, perverse effects. So, it was actually, so how many people here would have known that it was actually the government officials who said that the capital requirement for a bank around housing lending is half of that for any other form of lending, and then housing lending, you know, blows its top, uh, and lo and behold, um, you know, we have other problems associated with that. And then the very same people reviewed, um, you know, the regulation structure for banks. Um, you know, the Bail Agreement, the sort of people who are still reviewing all that were the same people who designed the system that didn't work so well. I was chairman of the ANZ Bank here in New Zealand and on the board in Melbourne when um, the ANZ Bank purchased the National Bank. Now that was, and I was, I was a very, I was a great enthusiast for that happening, as long as we did the right price. Um, but, so what really happened, um, almost overnight we announced we were going to by the National Bank. We did the deal with Lloyds to buy the National Bank. And almost overnight the Reserve Bank said, oh, um, we think we better have more control over this process. They introduced legislation in the House um, to give them more stronger prudential controls. That was passed in a hurry. Um, and then the Reserve Bank spent well over a year trying to work out how to actually make that work. Um, and John Anderson, who was the chairman of the, who was the CEO of the ANZ Bank, had been the CEO of the National Bank. He actually he didn't want to have anything to do with the Reserve Bank. He was so upset about it all. Um, and so I dealt with, as the chairman, non-executive chairman, I dealt with the Reserve Bank over a 
and was just stunned that they'd introduced this legislation, didn't have a clue how to make it actually work. Anyway, the net effect of all of that was that it cost us 250 million because we had to then bring all of our centralized systems, worldwide systems, had to be redesigned so that we just have a segment of them reproduced in New Zealand. All the banks have had to do this as well. Huge cost. No government official gives a stuff about the cost. Really? You know. So there we go. Um, these are the sort of dilemmas that one encounters, you know, not when you're a regulator, but when you're a working in the commercial world. So the regulatory risks are often very high and uncertain and few regulators um, understand that dilemma um, and, and few regulators seem to me to understand how the private sector actually then has to learn to cope with that and do things by other means that are legitimate um, but nonetheless um, a lower risk. Uh, the courts add to this problem severely because they've got a substantial, many of the Many of the cases I've been associated with se severe prejudice against the um, large corporate world. Um, and so they're often unsympathetic. So all of this commercial legislation has been designed to make our share market stronger because it had actually been in terminal decline for a long period of time. If you look at the, um, if you look at the graph, a, a graph of what has really happened to the share market, um, here it is. You'll see the New Zealand share market is the bottom one, the blue line. Um, the green line is Australia and the brown line is the OECD. And this is the market capitalisation of listed companies relative to GDP. Um, and so, you know, we are in the doldrums. That's what it really amounts to. And it doesn't matter how much legislation we introduce, uh, it's not going to fix the problem. Why do people think it is? I wonder. And here's the stocks traded. We're at the blue line again. Stocks traded, value of stocks traded as a percentage of GDP. Australia's the green line. OECD's the brown, uh, orange line. There we go. And you can see the dilemma again. So here we've introduced masses of new legislation, all designed to promote capital markets, and it's been useless. So what do we do about that? I mean, who in the government, or who, which government officials, think about the issues in these sort of economic ways? You know, well, we've done these things, we've said this is what the objective of our legislation is, it doesn't work out, so who then says, golly, you know, we've really messed this up. <laughs> now, this is what Murray Sherwin and co have got to get on to next. They've got to get back to these fundamental issues, <coughs> don't they? It's no good having 500 pages just telling people how to go through a better process for getting better regulation. It's about actually sitting down and thinking about, you know, we actually have got this screwed up. This is why life is an agony. This is, this is why we have so little in the listed world. And it's so little despite the fact that the government tried desperately to help us out by listing, you know, half of the energy companies in a half-baked sort of odd way. Oh, crikey. <laughs> so, so, what is good governance actually all about? It was actually not about regulations, but somehow or other it's got into the minds of ministers and government officials that they can lay out how you govern companies. They can lay out all the rules. Have you read the latest health and safety stuff? You know, I mean, it tells you how you, how you design a committee to look at health and safety and how you appoint a representative um, you know, from the staff uh, who can look after health and safety. But I mean, all that legislation doesn't count for a can of beans if the management of the company doesn't roll up its sleeves and really get stuck in on health and safety. I became neurotic about health and safety issues at Fletcher Building. Well, probably our workplace is probably as dangerous as any in New Zealand, right? You know, because we manufacture everything known to mankind. Um, and what did we do? Because we became neurotic and because we gave them specific, everyone specific targets, we gave financial incentives, the first page of every board report from every company within the 36 company group had to be on health and safety. Lo and behold, we ended up with a better health and safety performance than Woolworths and ANZ, the other two boards, the other two major boards I sat on. 
which intuitively, wouldn't you think they were much safer environments? <laughs> it was about just management, culture, incentives, doing it yourself. It wasn't about the bloody legislation. So, um, so what matters is strong leadership. Good strategies, clear objectives, you know, these are the standard, simple things. You know, if you want a course on management, just take that one page and that's it. You know, you don't need to go to university and do five years training in management. If you can do these things, um, then you're a manager. Okay? And legislation doesn't, doesn't provide for high integrity, and too often it doesn't have enough common sense. Um, so, um, here's what I'm saying. We can't simply regulate for all of these things that really make for good governance and make for good management and make for good commercial performance. The myth, however, is that we can do that. Now, the regulators will say, well, we're just creating the framework within which you're all going to behave yourselves like good people and, you know. I mean, even the Financial Markets Bill even says it's, it's going to provide for innovation. And, of course, MB's got innovation in its um, title, hasn't it? Um, well, I, I dealt with government agencies probably as much as any senior corporate person in New Zealand. You know, I was chairman of Fletcher's, chairman of Telecom, CEO of Telecom chairman of ANZ, and I can't remember any government agency ever trying to help us with an innovation. I can remember them putting roadblocks in the way of just about everything we ever wanted to do, um, you know, and then us ending up taking time. And often we'd get the okay, we'd just be very time consuming and sometimes very expensive. So it's all about these heaps of unintended consequences that I fret. Um, I won't talk about telecommunications because I think I should um, be drawing to a close. Um, but, I mean, essentially with telecommunications, we've got a huge new world and we've got very rapid growth of the broadband network uh, and new techniques are coming to pass. And yet we've got this, um, the fibre uptake is only 15% um, and it's only 5% of Chorus's total connection so far. We're actually the first in the OECD on fibre growth. So, that story is all very favourable, but if you look at the other side of the coin, um, you know, we've got a, a regulated chorus, our biggest network company, um, which has had 160 million bucks written off their earnings by the Commerce Commission, um, a fun $1 billion funding gap, uh, and the successive delays in the reviews, the network valuation uh, by the Commerce Commission that's only half of the network valuation um, that Chorus would say. So, the, you know, they've got a telecommunications industry which should be the most vigorous in the country, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and, in fact, what's really happening is that we're just getting a lot of debilitation. Um, and so their revenues are down, their earnings are down very strongly, um, they've stopped their dividend. Now, this is, a, this is, you know, one of the fastest growth industries in the country, and we're basically stuffing the company that's at the centre of it. I mean, do we really want to do that with regulation? Um, do we want to make sure that they can't pay a dividend? Is that what our intention is? Um, and here's their regulatory history. Um, but, and you can just see price, share price all over the place, and those are regulatory points. Um, and of course, then this spark. I mean, you know, when the government announced unbundling in 2006, overnight, Three billion dollars was written off. Three billion dollars was written off the telecom share price. So that was three billion dollars that New Zealanders lost, who, who people who held the shares. So was the country more than compensated by the unbundling regulations? And did anybody give us stuff? So now we've got a situation where, um, look at this graph. Here's the earnings on the right. Is the earnings of the um, telco industry? The whole industry on the right, and there's the earnings of the banks on the left. Now it's not a fair comparison in many ways, I know that, um, but I mean it is a startling situation, and it's particularly startling when you think that telecom used to be the biggest earner in the country in terms of profits. If you go back to the days when I was CEO of telecom, 
before it was so heavily regulated. We were also the biggest investor by far in capital expenditure, and we were also the largest taxpayer by a country mile, because we paid all our proper taxes and we paid a lot of taxes. So that's all been that's all gone asunder now. So here we have, you know, an industry. Look. Next graph. Look at this graph. Now, uh, there is telecommunications, okay? And along the bottom um, of the chart, there's the average labor productivity growth uh, and over time. And what essentially what that graph shows, according to the government's own statistics, is that telecommunications is the fastest growing productivity industry in New Zealand. And we're regulating it like hell, and we've squashed the profits so much of the companies that the government's now investing a couple of billion itself in this industry and has still not done any cost benefit analysis on that two billion dollars of taxpayers money. Help. No, I can't get this to move. It's protested. So at the end of the day, um, productivity growth uh, is the real key and as I said before, um, business adaptability severely eroded by um, regulation, in my view. And I go back to this graph that I had up before. In the period where we did a whole stack of deregulation, which a lot of people in New Zealand were critical of, of course, and still are, we had the highest rate of productivity growth that we'd achieved in several decades, many decades. That's all slowed down now, and we've been through the period of labour, we did a whole stack of re-regulation. This government has made a lot of the right noises about getting a better grip on regulation and doing a better job on regulation. I've given you a whole series of anecdotes from personal experience that shows that despite the efforts we're making, things in the commercial world, you know, are really very difficult uh, in the regulatory area. And so companies typically uh, look for other ways of doing things and often we can find other ways of doing things that are faster, more effective and free free of those regulatory constraints. So you might say to yourself, well, you know, there are the solutions. Um, but that's not the way the world should really work because what you've seen is that the New Zealand stock market is pathetic in terms of the listed companies. And it's that's despite all of the efforts the government professes to have made. Um, and now we're getting the government as the biggest investor in the telco industry, um, rather than the telco companies, because they're not allowed to make any money. Um, I could, I think I, 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 I really said my piece pretty much, so I'll, I've got some, well, I've now turned it off. I've got some summary charts here. If anyone's interested in the charts, they'd be very welcome to go through them. Um, are there solutions? Um, I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the only solutions are in really good leadership. You'd need the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Regulation or whoever. You know, you need them to really say they want to do a better job. What we did prove years ago was that we can do it if we want to. We can do stacks of deregulation and the world doesn't fall apart. Um, and we can get much faster productivity growth, you know, and deregulation is a contributor, but by no means the only factor, of course, but it is a contributor to that. If we really want to get productivity growth going, we're going to have to make things less expensive, less costly, and quicker for the private sector to get jobs done. At the moment, in the construction industry, and I've you know, had extensive experience, it takes us always longer for a major project, it always takes longer for regulatory approvals than to build a project. I mean, that's, and you tell, go and tell someone, I've just been up and Asia, you go and tell the Chinese that, and they can't stop laughing at you. No, they just don't understand how that can be the case. I can still remember, you know, conversation with the Chinese Minister of Telecommunications when they built a 3G network in a few months. You know, it took us years just to get regulatory approvals, let alone to actually build the network. We could build the network miles faster than we could ever get the regulatory approvals. So it's all about leadership. There are some principles that I've got listed there, and they'll all be familiar to you. Um, and you know, it's all about secure property rights and the certainty in the application of the law and things like that. They can all help, um, but at the end of the day, we need um, leadership to get that sorted out. There are techniques that can be used. The Productivity Commission has set out a whole stack of them. 
I applaud them because at the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to be in charge, and so we are going to continue to have all these masses of regulation. Uh, but what I really wanted tonight to do um, was was to just give you a sketch of the dilemmas around regulation. I think it would actually be pretty simple in many of these cases to straighten all that out, but I think it's politically probably impossible. Um, and if that's the case, as Gillian said, as we came back from China and Korea and Japan a few days ago, um, you know, she said, by comparison, it's as though we're sleepwalking. Um, and that's what we do, this sort of stuff, you know. So we get numerous reports, but what do they count for? At the end of the day, they're not actually showing up in higher productivity growth, they're not showing up in a stronger market. And that's a worry. So we're not going to really get economic growth unless we address these sorts of issues. The chances of doing so are slender. And I've talked too much. Thank you very much. Happy to take you. solution <coughs> missing from your very sensible list. We've got an absolute army of highly paid, overpaid bureaucrats led by a parliament and collectively the intellect level is no more than average. They don't understand most of what you're talking about but they do see you as a threat. When I say you, I mean your thing. Oh, yeah, me too. Okay. So, really... They're not going to ask me to do the job. No, no, no. I'm just trying to <laughs> Which is see what they whether should do. we should promote one okay. further solution to add to the list. Yep. And that is that we design a, an approach which is geared to making the... I mean, all this army of bureaucrats, they get their jollies out of regulation and they get fat paychecks. What we need to do surely as part of it is reduce the incentive to be a bureaucrat. In other words, there needs to be a societal type approach to this where you know you have more respect by actually growing some crops or delivering a better phone system or whatever the real economic activity is. But these people are not contributing to economic growth. This is a tie-in with your speech six months ago to the retreat about our relative standard of So we need to find ways to discourage people to want to go into this. Yeah, well, that's, so, what, that's what, of course, this um, publication by um, the New Zealand Initiative, <coughs> creating a toolbox for regional prosperity and uh, yep. you know, special economic zones and so on, was actually designed to say, well, how do we step out of this? So they're trying to become practical, you know, what steps can we take to change the incentives here and allow people to actually have a go at doing something in a different way and in a different, uh, less regulated environment. Yeah, because attached to that format would be less bureaucrats per... Don't bet on it. <laughs> well, yeah, well, my point is, we have to have, we have to have an approach which reduces the incentive to be a bureaucrat. Yep, I agree. It's all about incentives <coughs> and sanctions. We need to change the incentives. Yep. yep. And I mean that graph of mine that showed that public servants are paid on average so much more than people in the private sector. Right. Um, and that didn't used to be the case. I mean that <coughs> that uh, they only those numbers only part of company uh, around about uh, just after two thousand. Um, up to that point, they were pretty much. Um, on a par. Anyway, <coughs> there are other questions. Oh, well, Senator, thank you very much for quite an inspiring speech, actually, because you set out a totally different way that things could be at different times in your speech. But I just wonder, I mean, you basically said there was a, a period of public policy excellence, um, preceded by and succeeded by, as you put it, sleepwalking. And I wondered if you had any thought about why that is in New Zealand? Is it the supply side? Is it, as you say, um, the politicians like me a bit below the average intelligence? Um, or is it the bureaucrats, um, as Peter says, or, or is it actually on the demand side that the, the public are you know, kind of happy with the way things are and there's not a lot of demand for serious, high quality public policy reform or some other 
some completely different answer. Well, you're a much more adept politician than I would ever be able to be um, if I had aspirations <coughs> in that respect. So, you know, you're able to assess these things much better than me. But at the end of the day, um, I don't. The, the incentive is to remain in power, and the judgment at the moment is that you remain in power by not doing too much in the reform field, and that the reform field is just too risky in terms of retaining and exercising power. I think, I mean, that's my interpretation of it. When I talk to government ministers, which I don't do as much these days as I used to, um, about these issues, the interest is minimal. Um, and I think they do think many people in the corporate world are just self-interested rather than actually have a public policy perspective. I, tonight I've really tried to persuade, you know, outline some of the public policy perspective around this, saying, well, there's a whole stack of regulations we've got which have actually, you know, meant that these activities just don't occur anymore. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, prospectuses are the core of the Financial Markets Act, um, and people, you know, go to no end of trouble today now not to issue them because they've become such high risk documents. So I just don't, I just, there's just no willingness is there to, there's no, there's not been a crisis that would might induce one to say well we can take some risks and really go for it in terms of trying to get the economy back into good order. I think there's been reasonably sensible economic management on, certainly on monetary policy and on fiscal policy we're, you know, back into a a much more sensible position. It's been a slow grind, but we've, you know the government's got there, and great credit for that. Um, but in terms of really making life easier for the private sector, that simply hasn't happened. Um, well, also, and happened there's just not enough incentive for them to do that. Also, something's happened in the last several years. I, I was in government and now I'm in the private sector, and I was originally in a regulatory affairs role, and now I'm in a business development role. And the whole thing around property has really taken over the public sector. It, it's very difficult to engage with government because you can't pick up the phone and say, I, I don't think you quite understand how it works in the private sector. Everything is in writing and everything is with lawyers present. And so it's very costly for the private sector to actually engage with policy owners to say, you know, you've got the wrong with the state here, some different options, what are you actually getting at, what are you trying to achieve? And that's really been happening just recently over the last three or four years. <coughs> Um, I'd like to know what is different about New Zealand that will require a different solution. To a lot of the countries you compare us to, Australia, US and so on, we're actually relatively equally, if not less regulated than them. Maybe less, regu more regulated than China, I think. But, but why should New Zealand have a lot less regulation than a lot of these other countries that we, we would like to aspire to have the same growth as they do? And a simple answer, just to get a comparative advantage for ourselves. I mean, if we really want to get productivity growth, there's a number of things we have to do, including making life easier and more straightforward for the commercial world um, in order to get on with the job. Less expensive regulation, less time-consuming processes. Um, now, there are simple ways that you, there's actually quite simple ways you can do some of that. But I mean, at the end of the day, you're quite right that we have similar types of regulation to many other countries. That's the nature of the you know, Western world. Um, and maybe it's the price we pay for democracy as well. Uh, but my view always has been that it's not good enough just to compare ourselves to others and say, well, our regulatory structures aren't too bad compared to others. I've always thought we, I would like New Zealand to do better than other countries, and if we're going to do better than other countries, we would, we've got to address these issues. If we don't address them, we're simply not going to get there. You know, the fact that it takes long, so long to get regulatory approvals for any construction job of anything longer than it takes to do the job. Um, now other countries might have that dilemma as well, but that's no reason why we can't fix it. So it's all about just getting comparative advantage. You know, we're tiny, we're remote, how can we do better? So if you'll excuse me, the, the, the Soviets used to compare the Trabant, uh, the Lada and the Skoda, but the reality is they're all shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I, you know, I agree with yeah, you on well. a couple of things and challenge you on the third. Um, I, I agree we've hopelessly overregulated the financial markets. I've actually said this in the House. I used right. to draft prospectuses for banks for you know debt equity offerings for for, you know, for, for equity offerings. You know, I said I did a lot of it. And I also did it on my own account. 
and I've seen it get a lot worse and as a consequence you can't get decent directors and public offers because the risk that directors have to take is disproportionate to the reward that they get acting in a small innovative company. So it really sends the wrong, the wrong incentive. So I agree with you there. Ridiculous that um, all of the risks that were faced by um, Meridian and Mighty River Power, you had to fight through the prospectus to see that their biggest risk was actually price on work. Uh, uh, and you couldn't find it, even though that's reality, that that is their biggest long-term risk, that the government changes the rules and says you've got to pay for the water that goes through your hydro dams. Um, and a nonsense that having had that long prospectus, virtually anyone that wanted to invest in Meridian couldn't get advice about it, because lawyers aren't allowed to advise, and accountants aren't allowed to advise, and um, most of the people who were allowed to advise were conflicted because they were in the share offering groups through the share broking houses. So in the end, the public couldn't get advice as to whether they should invest in those shares. Yeah, the advisors are all fucked out of their minds. Yeah, so, yeah. so all of that's hopelessly over I agree with that. But in terms of the length of processes, this is a problem that we've got in New Zealand that actually goes to the essence of how we run our, not just our regulatory system, our court system. No one can afford to use it. Yep. You know, so courts and regulators don't serve their social purpose if they become so expensive and a protest process cost that no one can use them for either cost or reasons of delay. So I agree with that too. Where I don't agree with you is on the Commerce Act. And I, I, I you know, I, I, I have to challenge you on that because from an outsider, I think that for years you got away at telecom with taking hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars out of the New Zealand economy and flushing it down the toilet in Australia. And it took the regulator years to catch up with you. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I, I agree with you on all those other points, but I do not think that we are too heavily regulated by the, the Commerce Commission. Look, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a Commerce Commission and a Commerce Act. I, I mean, I, I, all I'm saying is that the processes under which they operate, in my view, could be vastly improved. Well, I agree with the process point, but that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a process point as to what it, as to, as compared with the the principles that should underlie decent regulation against excessive profit in, in, in infrastructure industries that have got monopoly characteristics, in my opinion. So, on your point about telecom, I'm very happy to chat with you offline <laughs> <laughs> about that, but other people might find that a bit tedious. <laughs> but at, at the end of the day, oh, yeah, I mean, I could go on about the Commerce Commission too, because there's been periods where the Commerce Commission has actually been much more amenable to getting quick solutions. It doesn't mean to say that they were easier to deal with so much as that they put you know, they were just tougher about getting solu solutions out in a timely way. Mm. It's often said that the Think Big program is a result of uh, people saying somebody should do something. And Bill Birch came along with something and some and they said, let's do it because it is something. <laughs> and I think a lot of the problem is when any issue is raised, whatever it may be, telecom prices or uh, competition issues or whatever it may be, the first thing you hear said on the morning report is, we need to regulate this better, we need yeah. to regulate it. Absolutely. And until such time as the commentators realise that the primary source of regulation throughout history has been competition, as we discussed earlier, um, I think the, the focus has got to shift. If you, if you can't have competition, okay, it's fair enough, you may need regulatory oversight. But generally speaking, competition is the, by far the best regulator of commercial activity. I agree. Which is why you should change radio station. I'll <laughs> 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 right, don't know how, but there's, there's other hands on you. We've got time. Bernard. Um, I don't want to depress you, but there's a case going on in the Supreme Court today and tomorrow on the Consumer Credit Contract Mass Act. And the Commerce Commission, I mean, the Act is pretty opaque and drafted. Uh, the Commerce Commission seemed to want to take a pretty strict cost plus approach uh, to the reasonableness of fees. Uh, questions from the bench indicate that they are in a sort of cost plus mentality. And I was talking to one of the counsel on the other side, and I was saying it's very difficult to explain to not. I think economists are sometimes guilty of failing to understand how little non-economists understand and make assumptions. You start talking about things at a level of detail instead of the fundamentals. And I was saying how difficult it is to explain to public servants that um, prices drive costs rather than the other way around. 
And uh, the council said, yes, he said, the, the taxi driver on the way from the airport got it just like that. Mm. Because he lives in the real world and has to pay for his car. Um, but the, the whole, uh, a lot of legislation in public policy seems to be based on this fallacy that the prices are driven by costs, rather than the other way around. Yes, and you see that with the hypothetical models that the Commerce Commission and the Telecommunications Commissioner have designed. You know, really taking cost structures out of other countries um, and, you know, inventing a modern network and putting a cost around that and ending up with a valuation of a network that's only half of what, you know, the commercial reality um, people would say it is. Um, that's the difference between Chorus and the Commerce Commission. I mean, you know, 13 billion versus 6 billion type of thing. Um, and that's all based off a academic theoretical model. It's a bit of a dilemma. Great question. Grant. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> back in the 1980s, as an economic consultant, I did a lot of work with the, New, the then New Zealand Mining and Exploration Association. I want to pose the hypothesis that in fact there's an unholy alliance between the government and, and the industry groups, in this case a lobby group, and the argument was, despite the fact that as bright, clever young economists, we presented them with the best possible rent and royalty systems, world practice, world best practice, they rejected any possible change because it would devalue, not in their words, but in economic terms, it would devalue the capital stock that they had in knowledge of how to get round the current regulations. And if you go changing the regulations on us, you know, we're going to lose, completely devalue that, and we're very clever at doing it, and our competitors aren't. Therefore, we just want it to stay the same. Your comment? Well, that applied to tariffs and input licensing and all of those sort of other protective mechanisms as well. And that's why I say it's all about leadership. Somebody's got to step over that. If we don't step over that, we don't make any progress. And we're not very good at it stepping over it, you know, and there was a question on the other side, yeah. sorry. Question about um, the impacts on competition. If you stopped 100 people in the street, they would basically say that regulation, the majority would say re regulation is good because it stops yeah. big bad companies taking advantage of it. Absolutely. Um, I, I generally uh, have, have found the opposite, that in fact if you're an incumbent, uh, and you're, you're reasonably well funded, re regulation is an advantage because you can pay the costs of compliance, etc., whereas new competitors cannot, and often they don't fit the regulations well. So I wonder if you would comment on the, is there a, a difference between the public perception and the reality of how regulation affects competition? I'm not expert enough about public perceptions, you know, to do other than uh, think about it in the same way that you would probably think about it, but I think, I think there is a difference, unquestionably. I was always told that price control kept inefficient retailers in business. Yep. <laughs> and I'm sure that was true with manufacturers and uh, certainly with oil companies as well. I mean, I think there is, I mean, the, the irony is that we all criticize the government all the time. And whenever there's a problem, we say the government should do something about it. And why have we never resolved that dichotomy in our heads? I don't know. It's stupid. Yes. Right. I, I take it that you don't have a very high opinion of the World Bank's recent report on the rates second in the world on ease of doing business. Oh, sorry, yes. Do I not have a very high report of that? Um, well, I mean, I understand why they got to that conclusion, and but at the end of the day, I live in the reality of the commercial world here, and you know, I've been chairman or CEO of several of the largest companies in the country. I've also been chairman of the New Zealand Seed Fund, which created some of the smallest companies in New Zealand, some of which are listed today in New Zealand and Australia. Um, so I've seen all those perspectives, um, and despite what the World Bank says, uh, you know, one of the biggest agonies of getting business done in New Zealand is regulation. And that's what uh, the Productivity Commission found um, when they did the survey. So that's another dichotomy. You know, I don't want to be critical of the World Bank. I mean, I used to work at the IMF years ago. So, Just to Murray. Roderick, thank you. Always interesting to, uh, to hear you speak on these subjects. Um, if we look at the incentives uh, that, that lead to this situation, it is abundantly clear that we have a small, intimate, and vigorous democracy. And 
when a dog bites a kid, a mine blows up, or a house rots, you know what's going to happen. Yep. And the, the, the imperative is to be seen to be doing something. And you can either spend money on it, or you can regulate it. And it's typically the regulatory bit is, is, is going to come easier in tight fiscal conditions. And you can see that going on all the time. Yep. And the incentives are on the politicians, and on the bureaucrats, and having been a bureaucrat in regular positions myself, and, and in public sector leadership positions, um, the overwhelming balance of pressure coming in on that office always is to do more, uh, not to do less. And it's absolutely leadership, and it's transparency also. It's it's things like boring things like like um, regulatory impact statements that do the analysis, do the cost-benefit analysis, try to draw out the unintended consequences, and a, a, a set of institutional structures which actually allow those things to get see the day of light, of the light of day, to, 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 to come up and be in front of decision makers who are making the decision and have to confront a piece of solid analysis which says, you do this, you're going to get these consequences. That's a very good note to end on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Roderick. It was great to have you with us. It was great to hear your perspectives from your various um, institutional experience, of course, dealing with regulations and as, as a former regulator yourself. I think um, you probably sketched out some of the work program that we have to get into as a New Zealand initiative over the next few years. We'll have a lot to do. But um, for now, I would just like you all to join me in thanking our speaker, Roderick Dean, for his talk. final housekeeping remarks. Um, there are of course plenty of other things that we could still discuss. Please do so over a glass of wine, join us. And um, because this is our last event for the year, may I just wish you all the best for the festive season. We hope to see you all back in the next year. Until then, thank you very much and good night.